If making bald jokes is cause for violence, everyone in this studio, plus Lynch and Rich Banks, should all be dead by Brian's hand. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get it on. Mandate should get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Grant? That's right. And Bull Brian. I'm staying in my fucking ugly lane. All right. Well, uh, Chris has his bachelor party. He's back. Triumphant um, return. Gina took a picture of the f- famous, infamous, mm, infamous staircase that I had to jump when I graduated uh, the sixth grade. <laughs> you didn't right. have to, but you had to. Yeah, there's a picture of it on the side street by the church. There's a closer picture uh, of it as well. Oh, that's a sizable staircase. Probably yeah. bigger than you at the time. <laughs> yeah, it was a big staircase. There's, I don't know how many stairs there. Like a 10, dozen? 11. Uh, they've, like since, 11. they've since put up a fence. and I The also, Corolla fence? Yeah. Yeah, I think they put up a railing. As well, but uh, that's for grinding, bro. Y- you right. can uh, you can see that uh, getting a run at that and making it through without catching uh, either side of the cement wall, which is about five feet wide, would would have been a trick. I wasn't able to pull it off, but yet, <laughs> yet I was compelled. Yeah, and uh, that's that's the part I'm interested in in life. That part where you're nagged by your own fears. I guess uh, I guess the thing is is pe- everyone has fears and most people sort of give in to them immediately. You should try to fight them mm. a little bit, push back on them. Uh, don't get yourself killed on a BMX bike, but kind of go, why is that? Yeah. And I would also argue the something that's a trend now is uh, let's not shout it out into the heavens every ten seconds. The being like, afraid. Yeah, I used to. Uh, I used to always wonder about that when I was. Um, working at the man show ironically and i talked to all the writers and they'd, they'd be like oh man i honked at this guy and he got out of his car and i wet myself man i freaked out like i and it's like why why you you're 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 willing it into yeah. existence you know what i mean you shouldn't be that comfortable with your uh, lack of dignity in that moment yeah and but I, verbalizing like that, you're kind of inviting sympathy or at least um, simpatico, you yeah, know what I mean? Right. Like, as People opposed do. to, you're not saying it like, please make fun of me for you know my cowardice. Got that drop. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like, please identify with us. Recognize it. People do this thing where they go, oh, I cannot. Like, how many women announce, I can't do math. I can't do any kind of math at any time. Like, they just right they're right push, they push it out there. We know. We know. Now, maybe you're... <laughs> Maybe um, you're not Stephen Hawking, but right. you can go, I'd like to get better at math. That's but it's true. ever like, I cannot, I can't do mm-hmm. any of this thing. And then it uh, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, I got fucking punished by the universe for that because now I've learned Common Core because I have to do homework at night yeah. for oh. a child. So, yeah, be careful what you shout out into the heavens. Also, I'm um, curious on your take on this discussion I had with Dr. Drew earlier, which is, um, you know, masculinity is kind of, we have toxic masculinity now. Any masculinity, I I think, is considered toxic, at least out here in Hollywood and L.A. (laughs) Except for the Oscars. But (laughs) celebrated. Yeah. then we have, you know, so it's like, yeah, okay, in 50 years we'll all be chicks, and we're kind of going down that route. Um, But I'm saying to Drew, I'm starting to think that everything needs to be exercised. So you're, we all know your body needs exercise. Oh, I thought you meant like a demon. Like oh, exorcise. Yeah. Exorcise. No, okay. Sure. Exercise. Out. And uh, then, then um, you know, if you have a racehorse, you got to take it out and you got to exercise yeah. that horse. And then it started to spill into your immune system, as we've been discussing, needs kind of a workout. And I was speaking to a doctor earlier, and he's saying your brain needs to be worked out. You you got to work out your brain. You gotta Stays off dementia. Do these crossword puzzles yeah. and and a lot about stress and how crappy stress is mm-hmm. for your brain and blah blah blah. He was basically saying uh, you could eat a candy bar or you could be stressed out, and it kind of affects your body the, yeah. the, the same way. So if you're trying to lose some weight, try to work on the stress a mm-hmm. little. Dr. Patrick is his uh, name, Porter. Anyway, it's uh, into the brain. Anyway, um, but I was talking to Dr. Drew, and I, he said, like, you know, what's going on with everybody? 
And uh, why are we all turning the way we're turning and going to our safe spaces and so on and so forth? And I said, well, I think masculinity needs to be worked out. Sure, you have to sure. work it out like anything else. Like you can't, you know, and, and it used to be baked into the cake. Your masculinity was worked out because you had to chop wood on a daily basis and you had to start a fire. And you had, on the table, literally. You had to go kill something and gut it, you know, and, and do all. So it was like a, we were mandated to work out our masculinity. And then we moved into the cubicles and the air conditioning and all that kind of stuff. And we decided to kind of outsource everything, the food or call the AAA. They'll change the spare tire. And uh, you don't have to build yourself a, a dollhouse for your kid. You can just order it on eBay. And we, I think we start to atrophy. I think, mm. I think the masculinity is a workout. And it, you don't have to get into bar fights every weekend. But you have to do things that were a little more traditional do you do you think that sports would be a good way to sort of bake that into the equation as you say yeah i mean sports i mean what is you know high school wrestling is just literally a simulation of what men used to do you know in combat and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff like yes i think i think that workout the simulation you know the treadmill is as good as is going to the well ten miles one one way or the other. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. I was, that's a great example. However, I'm thinking about the people listening to this. People on the show. People listening to the show. Thirty, forty, fifty year old dudes. They're not going to go out for wrestling. You know what I mean? Like, what are what are achievable masculine things that you? Let's say you're making a, a list, a masculine list of achievable goals you want to do in the next week or month. I would have to say um, fighting with strangers online. I think we've yeah. got that unlocked. Work it out. <laughs> Gina, that's kind of <laughs> kind of the opposite. Of oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I think <laughs> instead of saying, you know, do this and do that, uh, I'll tell you just one thing. It just comes up. Just clean your garage. Just go clean your garage. It's not that masculine, but it just you're engaged. Mm -hmm. You're on your feet. Mm -hmm. You're moving around. Mm -hmm. You're breaking a sweat. I would say to recapture some of your masculinity. Simply do more things that you could do for yourself versus outsourcing those things. Well Wash your own car, mow your own lawn, uh, go out, you know, go out, grab a piece of meat, marinate it, barbecue it versus Grubhub, right. you know, just, just do more things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you could do and or will learn to do sort of as yeah. you go in order to just simulate that and kind of work that, that muscle out. Do but, you, do you own a pressure washer? You must. Yes. I figure most of us don't. But Multiple. That's, a, that's yes. an easily rentable item. And if you're going to just clear off your walkway or it's your so driveway, fun. It's, 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 uh, fun. it's easy. It's fun. It's kind of, it's, you're cleaning shit up. You're using a fucking mm -hmm. power tool. And not yeah. only that, pressure wash like the outside of your house. Yes. You have no idea how much soot Pollen. builds up all over the stucco and the sills yep. and all the all that just yes, spend a weekend pressure washing your house and, and use it on your car like just do what Dawson does, make a rock wall in <laughs> yeah. front of his abode. Yeah. Like it just you just you're you're out of it and also get yourself as I was speaking to uh, the doctor about this, I said, you know, he said, look, everyone's on their phone too much. They're on the news too much. They're, 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 they're engaged too much. You need, you need to get to places where you're not thinking about Ukraine or Will Smith. It's just, you're, you're thinking about something. And I said, uh, well, you know, it was interesting. I went down to the ocean this morning try to get in the ocean before I come in to work when I'm out by the ocean. And I said, you know, it was kind of stormy and cloudy rainstorm and, and the surf was big. Uh, and there's nobody on no lifeguard. And there's nobody else on the beach. I was alone. And I was, Oh there. my God, you're going to be killed by an undertow. <laughs> I was there this morning and Hope I was like, <laughs> I, I stood there in sort of waist deep water and the waves were rolling in and they were big because there was this big, big surf. And I, and I was looking at it and I was trying to kind of time it like, cause they'll come in in a set of three or four mm -hmm. and then it'll calm down and then you can get out a little bit, get under something, float around a little bit and get back in. But I had a mind toward, I can feel the pull 
and nobody's going to miss me when I'm gone anyway, but they're not even going to start looking for me for two days. And and I was just like, there's nobody else here, so I have to be mindful of this. And I, I found myself just looking out under the horizon going, when's that next set? What is that out there? But I realized in doing that, I was thinking of nothing other than a little bit of self-preservation in the next set. Mm -hmm. I had no thoughts of Sean Penn or Ukraine in my head at all. I was just solely focused on that next wave that was coming in. And when you're going down a hill on a trail in the woods on a mountain bike and you're moving along at a pretty good clip, there's nothing except for where's the next tree and where's yeah. the next rock. It's and immediate. I don't want to hit my head. Yeah. And uh, he said, yeah. And, and by the way, he also said, and I won't get into all the machinations of it because I can't even remember of it, but there is a, the ocean has a tuning that tunes with you or you tune to the ocean and you got to get out to that. And the same with the mountains, like you, you, it changes the tuning in you. Your sound body bats, changes. The waves. You got to do it. Joshua Friedman. <laughs> I'm is telling what you, we got a live show in J Tree coming. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> let's not get too far off the mission because we got March Madness. Oh, a uh, real quick then. I just want to ask because it came to mind, Gina, you tell me if this falls more hmm. under chivalry or masculinity. Oh, I can't Maybe wait. it's the same thing. Okay. But uh, I, I tipped all the guys out there because I did this recently and it felt amazing and I expected to. Give up your seat, offer to give up your seat to either someone older than you or more infirm or, or mm -hmm. a woman or whatever like that. Get, make that offer. I would just like to sit down here because it's, uh, it's a little bit of a dwarfin rush. It's a panty wetter. <laughs> All right. But I have to say, I don't know how chivalrous it is because I do that too. I think it's also a Midwestern it's thing. Masculine. Hold a lot of You're doors. I am also very masculine. But yeah, it's a panty wetter. All right, uh, Max Zapata, back from the bachelor party. Yeah, thank you for generously mm -hmm. letting me have the time off. Yeah, look, I had a choice. But go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, I went to Fremont Street in Vegas. Oh, That's no. like the, the downtown area. Mm -hmm. Stayed at the Real World Suite. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, filmed Real World. Wait, at uh, the mm -hmm. Palm? No, this was in at the the Oasis. Oh. I don't think they charge for this, Gina, downtown. Oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah. They pay you. Was, yeah, there, there were awesome. uh, 19 of us. <gasps> oh, we my. Were, we were rolling what? deep. Wow. Chris yeah. had a drawer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, nine people in the suite, though. Matt Fondelier also joined me and my, and my friends in the suite. These are friends ranging from middle school, Gave high us? school, mm -hmm. bus, college, Matt and Gary. So, yeah, it, 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 was, it was a really good crew. It got off to a pretty rough start. Uh, so as as you know, I went straight from here to the airport, and I flew southwest. And southwest lets you check two bags in mm -hmm. for free. Mm -hmm. So I had one bag full of booze already, sure. and oh, I thought wow. I had my my carry on bag that I I filled with clothes. And I was like, I'll just check this one into might as well. It's just a it's just a hop skip oh, away. Oh no! And uh, it was a late check in, but uh, it, it, everyone seemed fine. Everyone else was doing late check in too because it, it's such an easy flight. And I, I get my bags, go um, go up to the room, and I open my bag, and I had a wallet in there. My wallet completely cleaned out. What? Oh, yeah. my. I all thought you were going to say, like, one I, of the bottles broke. No, everything was fine, all my clothes, everything, but in an internal zippered pocket in my bag. Wow. Clean, completely cleaned out by who, by baggage person or TSA Holy or something. Holy shit! Like we're talking like license and credit cards too, or just the cash? Just or? the cash. All the all That's of my cash. I had all the because I I travel like I use my phone as my wallet with all my cards, but I brought some cash for like gambling and whatever. And, oh. uh completely gone. Like just the and, best uh, laid plans. Yeah. yeah. How much cash? Uh, it was four digits. Oh easily. my god! Yeah. Four digits. Four whole digits, Adam. And I, I was on the so uh, I didn't I obviously didn't sleep that first night. I was just so bummed and it violated, and I and I felt like an idiot for checking in a bag That's full a of point. that. That's it's a just good like, point. But it's just like you guys are government employees. Like I thought I could trust you. And like, you can file a claim, but they'll be like, "Yeah, right." Oh, that, I'm uh, sure so you had that. First thing I did, I called the the airline. They said they're they're. Uh, I got on the phone. Somebody they're like. You can uh, you just go to our website, click contact, and you you file a claim. Yeah. Or you can and I'm like, are there cameras? Like, aren't doesn't my bag go through cameras for people who look through them and everything? They're like, oh yeah, well you can call the the police, the Burbank oh. Airport Police. So I did, mm -mm. and they're like, oh have you have you checked with the airlines? They're oh just putting God. me across to everybody else, Hot and then potato. 
Yeah, and uh, Chris, the theme of this podcast for the last two years is you can't trust the government. I'm I, whether it's I'm, Hunter Biden's laptop or masks or Fauci, you can't trust the government. I'm losing so much faith in humanity. Oh it, it just God. with all like the stuff that's been stolen from me, whether it was the wedding venue, the stuff out of oh. Oakland in the car, and now this. And like, so yeah, uh, Burbank PD is like, okay, we'll put some people on, we'll get back to you. Obviously, they haven't. And then they said, well, you should check with TSA too, because TSA, you know, you should check with the Vegas airport as well. I mean, who knows if Vegas. Vegas, uh, you know, could, they could have stolen it in Vegas. And I'm like, I'm checking everywhere. Oh, but right. how do I put me in touch with TSA? How do you do that? I'm like, oh, you just go to their website, yeah. TSA.gov, oh, and click God. contact. And, uh, and you, let you me can let out. me tell you one of the uh, perks of being a rich guy. I haven't done that fucking thing where I've been on the phone with the customer service thing. I haven't done that shit in 17 years. Jesus. I, I, it's like Ugh. somebody sends me something from Amazon or I get something that's wrong or whatever. I just go, fuck it. I just eat it. Yeah. I'm like, I look, that 2,200 bucks, I'll never see it again. I'm done. And I won't. I, and. And I'm not going to be on hold or get on the website or go in a circle or be talked down to by people who don't care. The guy who answers the phone is probably the guy who lifted the wallet. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think Jim would do that. What's your name? On Jim. The way out of the so on the way to the theater where we did not see Lost City, which I did see yesterday, and you're right, it's only kind of meddling. Um, we uh, They're like, oh, go in this line of customer service to get your refunds. And I looked at the line with 50 people. I'm like, fuck this. I need the 22 bucks. Yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, people go, hey, man, 20 22 bucks is 22 but yeah but your time yeah, you yeah. got to like factor that, that, that 45 in 45 minutes uh wow and i'm with you first off these guys are probably the tsa guy look they're bonded they have to be vetted you can't work at the airport and have like uh, al-qaeda sleeper cells <laughs> over there and stuff so they're just ripping shit off why no cameras? I, I'm with you. Air, airport, there's a camera well, I, every four feet. And I and I, that's what I said. So I was like, there has to be camera footage. How is there a way you can look? I mean, I was a late check in. There's like a 20 minute window of my bag going from uh, my hands to the plane. Can you just look and see? Like I described the bag, and they, the cops are just like. Yeah, I don't know how we could get that footage, though. <laughs> it's a, it's like, who would have it? It exists, and I'm sure Garagos could subpoena it, but then what the fuck? You're in for 10,000 bucks. Mm. Yeah, they it, try it, to make it so you'll just go away. It's it's it is also very um, discouraging when you then call the people who are supposed to do something and they kind of want you to buzz off. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, the yeah, your Burbank uh, Airport. Every time I see that weird trike thing <laughs> yeah. for carrying the uh, uh, Paul Blart with, three wheels, yeah, yeah. with the one flat tire, I'm like, that kind of sums it up. First off, why not have a pack mule or something? You need to be carried. The, the terminal's 170 <laughs> feet long. Do you need to, by the time you fucking unplug this thing and get it started, the shit's already gone down. How about you break into a jog? You'll be down at the end at 40 seconds. But uh, yeah, sad. Yeah, so that I, I lost a lot of sleep the first night. <laughs> that but, uh, sucks. It's okay. I um, still had a great time with everybody and drank a lot of alcohol. And, it's uh, not a bad yeah. ruse. What's that? You show up wherever you show up, bachelor party. You are the bachelor. You're just one of the guys. You, uh, you tell the same story Chris just told, except for uh -huh. you weren't ripped off. Go fiddle around on the computer have some fake conversations. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I'll be giving you a piece of my mind. And then you hang up. Ugh. And then everyone pays for your shit for the rest uh, of the trip. Oh, yeah. I you could, you I got could, 18 guys. I they all go, let's <laughs> chip in 100 bucks. Sure. I thought about this, uh, which is why I didn't tell anybody. Except oh, like my God. Guys. I told them not to tell anybody. I, the modest. second I found out. I don't want to be, I don't want to put a damper on it. But now that it's over, yeah, it's... Uh, so there, there. Th there's there's one guy, at least, and probably multiple guys, who just make a habit of rifling through people's luggage and pulling out anything of any value like and uh, calling it a day. Yeah, I mean, I asked him. I was like, Does, have you heard of this happening at all? Am I the first person to ever tell you this? Like, what... What's going on? They're like, yeah, we don't know. It's just, yeah, they just get check with the the airline, check with the. They just direct me to everybody else. Nobody wanted it to deal with it. Which I feel, I feel like it's got to happen on a on a semi regular basis. Because yeah. whoever this guy is, it's, he's not one and done. Right. Yeah. You know, this is what he does. This no, is and just... this is this is a a a move with purpose because it was a hidden wallet in my bag. That's a good point. Yeah, they're rifling and the stuff just kind of goes from the uh, 
the counter, right, where you check in, just the airplane's sitting right outside on the other side of the wall, right? It's not like a long, you know, maybe at the Denver airport, they have right. 70 Russell. miles right. of bags, and you're like, I don't know, any point someone could have gotten involved. This I've is, seen Die Hard, too. This would take, like, three ring bell, ring doorbell cameras to completely suss out. Yeah. If they wanted to. But I, I don't know how they can get that footage. They don't know. It can't be done. I, I wonder... You think there's some TA, TSA union thing where they're like, we don't want cameras. Like, you know, teachers don't want cameras in the classroom. But if you're TSA, like, tough shit. It's a security issue. I feel the same way about teachers. Like, tough shit. You're there. You're uh, you're on the public dime and you're teaching kids or you're TSA. Like, well, sorry, but we need to know what you're what you're doing over here. Yeah, how does it hurt? And usually they leave that note because every time I travel with you I'll, in my gear case... 10 out of 10 times I get that. Hey, we're TSA. We went through your bag. Mm. All right. So let's see. We got uh, that. God, let's see. We got March Madness Madness coming. Uh, we got the news. We got uh, Yardley coming in. All right. You guys talk. Let me grab my, let me grab my bell or start okay. playing the music. There gossip. we go. We're back for another round of March Madness Madness. Today, we continue the big rants with the last four matchups of the Bittersweet 16. Yesterday, a quartet of complaints careened into the irate eight. Teachers unions said good day, A, eh? to Justin and sent Justin Trudeau back to the not so great white north. Chris Harrison wishes he rose to the occasion, but was beaten by Colin Kaepernick. Graffiti got locked in a cage at Home Depot and locked out of the tournament by the LA Marathon, and Red Turn Arrows got a ticket out of the tournament at the hands of unrinsed coffee mugs. First up in today's tourney, closing out the California Conference, no matter who loses, L.A. wins. It's L.A. Homeless versus Barbara Ferrer. Oh, where's my thing? L.A. Homeless. Well, again, homeless. That's the problem. It's not that they don't have a home. Look, if you were Lamborghini-less, <laughs> then we could solve that problem by getting you a fucking Lamborghini. And if you're Tiara-less, then we get you Tiara. And we would solve that problem. But that's not what the problem is. It's not homeless. Yes, a car is called a horse-less carriage. It's a fucking carriage without a horse, but this ain't that. This should be called what it is. Sober less, sane less. That's the problem. If we fucking identified it and labeled it correctly because we have all these fucking fakakta politicians going, we need more homes for the homeless. Conduct this experiment. Let's just say I picked a random homeless person, just random. I went through LA and I just tapped one guy on the shoulder. And I said, fine, you get to move into my condo for a month. What the fuck would happen? It would be a shit show. We all know it and that's why we need to change the name of it barbara ferrer oh god damn i was thinking about her and i thought you know what i don't want her setting policy she's so dour she's always in a bad mood she's frumped up all the time i hate to sound sexist gina grad mm. But she needs a good shagging. A good shagging would clear all the cobwebs in her brain. And better yet, get pregnant. Oh. Focus on something other than yourself. And I have the man for the job. Oh. You know who's going to save L.A. from Barbara Ferrer? LL Cool J. Jeez. He give her fucking shagging of her life, and that bitch would come in whistling and smoking, holding a martini, going, I don't know, do what you want. I got to get back to LL Cool J. Mama said, knock you up, bitch. Cut it short there. Can't do better than that. Okay, wow. I felt he came out strong with the homeless. I said, no matter what he does from here on out, it's a lock. Now... Blowout. The homeless admittedly has more meat on the bone. Yeah. You know I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a citywide issue. Barbara Ferrer, I'm thinking to myself, where's it going to go with this guy? You know, we, we, we've done about all we can. Oh, no, we've not. Oh, no, we've not. <laughs> and 
to that point, I hate to do this to him, but I kind of want to know I where he's going to go I'm next. Kinda, I'm kind of morbidly curious. Where are we going next to Barbara Ferrer? Ferrer. Ferrer. The upset. <laughs> next up in the big government conference, it's an alphabetical altercation. It's AOC versus the TSA. Oh, oh, TSA. Got a lot of new material on that now. <laughs> AOC, look, let's stop electing people based on their aesthetic. I'm completely convinced that's all there is. We're not gay guys shopping for a convertible. We're, we're electing people who set policy into motion. Tax the rich. Let the rich pay their fair share. The fucking rich pay for everything, bitch. You spray painting it on a fucking ball gown is not any way to solve any problem whatsoever. And her background. She was a bartender. Go back to the fucking well, bitch. Go 10 bar. Go fucking throw the rag over your shoulder. I don't want you setting policy anymore. And let's stop listening to people just because they're beautiful, except for me. I understand I have a certain aesthetic and it got me a certain place in life. That you should do. And you need a good fucking from LL Cool J. Sorry. Wow. TSA. Well, I'll tell you what. I think you can... They say you judge a society by how it treats its prisoners, but you can judge a city by how nice or how shitty their TSA is. When you travel to L.A. and go through TSA in L.A., it is a fucking shit show. When you go to some nice town in Iowa, how are you doing? Where are you traveling to? Number one. Number two, I know these guys have a lot of training. Like, how do you get that inner zipper over? over it? How do you get the cash out of a wallet in less than three seconds? How, how, how? But I'll tell you what they really need. They need some etiquette training. I don't care if the person can smell gunpowder or frisk you or use the wand. Fine, do all that. I want to know if you're a decent human being. I want to know if you like cats or dogs. I want to know if you like that Borat movie. I want to know what kind of fucking human being you are. And Chris, you got off light because that person lifted 1300 bucks for you. When they stole my backpack and I missed those two shows at the casino, they lifted 50 grand from me. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you. I feel like we're bordering on blowout territory. Yeah, I do too. TSA's just got so much. And plus, yeah, he had the good insight about the, you can tell a society. Yeah. Like, you go to LAX, which I do a lot, like the TSA there, you're lucky if it's neutral. Oh, and if you get the, for the 11th time, uh, please sit out your life. Yeah, fuck them. TSA goes forward. Capping off the Classics Conference. Waiters and tipping versus backup beepers. Well, first things first, a little etiquette, some rules, some rules to apply to waiters and waitresses. First, bring back the fucking name tag. I like the goddamn name tag. I want to say your name. I want to know who you are. Secondly, how about a little peripheral vision? I've seen waiters skim right by, fucking lit a signal fire at my table. Like, hey, over here. Hey, I want the fresh ground bars. Like, right, right on fucking by. Just like a fucking citizen with a good street beating going down, and I don't want to get involved. The other thing I want, new rules. Sorry, Bill Maher. You bring the fucking accoutrements out before the meal. Uh, whatever goes with the steak, whatever goes with the fries. I don't care if it's ranch, a ketchup, A1, mustard. I want it all on the fucking table before the meal shows up. If I order another thing of fries or hash browns, and then I'm like, where's the ketchup? And they're, oh, hold on, let me circumnavigate the globe and rub one out in the bathroom <laughs> and call my mom. And then I'll come back with it. Now I'm eating fries I don't want, and it's not dipped in anything. Backup beepers. That's right. All right, first off, we're all tuned out to the backup beeper. The beep, beep, beep doesn't mean shit. All it does is wake you up. You don't move anymore, and they're all the same. The backup beeper with the uh, forklift at the Home Depot is no different than the garbage trucks, no different than the backhoe, no different than the skip loader. We need a different sound. We're tuned out to the sound. We don't look at the sound. We don't listen to the sound. We don't react to the sound. And it's a very negative sound. You know what I mean? When you get something wrong on the test, beep, you're wrong. How about we replace it with something a little more uplifting? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or nice, nice, nice. Or uh, in Japan, hi, 
Hi! Hi! Uh, it's just something affirmative, like, good! 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 And then I'd be laying in bed, and I'd be rolling around, and I'd hear in the distance, good! 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 And I think, you know what? It is a good day. Wow. Do we have, dare I say, we have three blowouts? I mean, Adam inadvertently just described Dance Dance Revolution. True. Good, 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 yes, good. good. Bad. You're absolutely right. Tipping, that's been the darling. Yeah. That's been the one we've all, we, we figured it would go the distance, but I say it's time to bid adieu. The, I think that backup beeper is genius. The performative nature really won me over. You know what the champ uh, had to defend his title? It got mm. surprised today. Indeed. Backup beepers. Finally, the unstoppable force meeting the immovable object. A heavyweight matchup in the pop culture conference. Two people who'd pop the buttons on their jeans. It's DJ Khaled versus Lizzo. Well, first off, DJ, I need you to hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up on ripping off another fellow artist beat. Hold up on charging the stage at the Oscars. Hold up, hold up, hold up on that second piece of cake you're about to annihilate. Hold up, oh, I'm thinking about playing Richie Haven's acoustic guitar. Hold up, hold up, hold the fuck up. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. And also, he's my number one leader in the clubhouse of guys who shape their beard not to be fat. You're fucking morbidly obese. The fact that you got a straight edge going on your double cheek doesn't mean shit to us. So hold up on shaping the beard. Hold up on the second ladle of gravy. Hold up on ripping people off. Hold up on everything you do. Use your own words. Heed your own words. And hold the fuck up, DJ Khaled. Lizzo. I found out how Lizzo got her name. Her name was originally just Liz, and then she came out in a one-piece thong, and everyone went, oh! She scared the fuck out of everyone. And from that point on, she was Lizzo. Yes, Lizzo, you have problems. But no one wants to see you cry from your mansion. Every single one of her videos where she's explaining how she's so put upon and oppressed and held down is her standing in front of a double sub-zero or out on a balcony with a view of L.A. by a swimming pool or in a bathroom filled with fucking Carrera tile. Go to some shitty apartment in Van Nuys and film your fat ass crying. I don't want to see it from your palatial estate. As the great Tom Hanks said, there's no crying in mansions. (laughs) Nobody cries in mansion. And I'll tell you what would fix that bitch up. A good shagging from LL Cool J. Well, I got to say, I do love the running theme that LL Cool J could solve many of society's and LA's problems. It's really a shame that one of these great competitors has to go home and sit Yeah, that being said, I love the idea of using DJ Khaled's words against him. I think it's brilliant. I think it's clever. And I'd like to see more of that. That combined with, I'm not, I don't know about you, Gina, I doubted the veracity of a couple of Adam's claims. <laughs> I forgot her name. <laughs> I don't know. I have to look into that. Yeah. That said, I'm leading DJ Khaled. Yeah. Well. Khaled it is. Check your brackets at adamcarolla.com and tune in tomorrow for the irate eight in March. Madness. Madness. All right. We got Simply Save and then we got the news. U.S. News and PC Magazine and Popular Science. All ranks. Simply Safe Home Security is the best home security of 2021. And U.S. News just named Simply Safe Best Home Security of 2022. This is a great product. We all use it here. Peel and stick. No running wires. No drilling. No pulling wires. And batteries last up to 10 years. Protect every door, window, and room 24-7. Backed by the best professional monitoring in the business. Ready to dispatch police, firefighters, or EMTs. Less than a buck a day, you set up yourself. Just takes about 30 minutes. No long-term contracts. And you can try it out for 60 days risk-free. Customize your home's perfect system in just a few minutes. Go to simplysafe.com slash Adam. Go today, get the free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring at simplysafe.com slash Adam. All right, take a quick break. Come back and do the news right after this. 
was hoping to move on from this, but we can't because there's still some uh, some juicy little tidbits about the Will v. Chris uh, slap heard around the world. So Will did issue an apology. I did win a little bit of money from my friends because they decided that Chris was going to apologize first. I said, absolutely not. Uh, Will Smith said, uh, and I'll just read the whole thing. Um, and he posted this on Instagram. Violence in all of its forms is poisonous and destructive. My behavior at last night's Academy Awards was unacceptable and inexcusable. Jokes at my expense are part of the job. But a joke about Jada's medical condition was too much for me to bear. And I reacted emotionally. I would also like to apologize to the Academy, the producers of the show, all the attendees, everyone watching. I would like to apologize to the Williams family and my King Richard family. I deeply regret that my behavior has stained what has been an otherwise gorgeous journey for all of us. I would like to publicly apologize to you, Chris. I was out of line and I was wrong. I'm embarrassed and my actions were not indicative of the man I want to be. There's no place for violence in a world of love and kindness. Then Jada chimed in on her page that simply said, this is a season for healing and I'm here for it. Wow. Just yeah. this season? This is just this season. How, when does it end? Um, a couple other people chimed in, though, that I thought were interesting. Mm -hmm. um, first... The Laugh Factory. I don't know if you've seen the marquee today. No. But go ahead and put that up. Um, it's in full support of Chris Rock. Um, it's it's a big sort of uh, light up uh, billboard. Yeah. And it says Laugh Factory <clears throat> supports First Amendment right for all comedians. The comedy community loves and supports you, Chris. So that's big. That's up in, in big, bold letters at the Laugh Factory. And Jim Carrey, because I never know anymore with Jim Carrey what he's going to say about anything. So yes. anything he says surprises me. So for some reason, this surprises me. Talk to me about it. Yeah, he was on CBS with Gail King, and he said, I was sickened. Um, I was sickened by the standing ovation. I felt like Hollywood is just a spineless en masse. I really felt like, oh, this is really a clear indication that we're not in the cool club anymore. He And then as for... Uh, Chris suing, he said he didn't want the hassle. I would, uh, I would have announced this morning that I was suing Will for two hundred million dollars because of the the video is going to be around forever. It's going to be ubiquitous. That insult is going to last a very long time. Hmm. And then I think it was. Um, I agree with Jim Carrey. Yeah, me too. I and mean, it to some degree, might have mm -hmm. been Michael Che. I can't remember, but somebody was just like, "Why the fuck do comedians bother being the the jesters for these assholes anymore?" Well, I'm um, reading here that Jeff Ross cried when it happened. <laughs> comedians are weird. What, what do you mean? Weird, yeah, well, the, the, all, weirdly all the comedians sensitive. were saying, like, they're like, okay, this now invites people to come walk up and attack us on stage. Kathy like Griffin huge, said the same thing. Yeah, huge movement on, on from all, all the comedians. And then Jeff Ross posted that. Yeah, he, he said, I worship Chris Rock. I cried when I saw Smith attack him because I was watching my idol live out a comedian's worst nightmare on mm. live television. I don't know. Does it invite everyone else to come up? I, I don't. I, I feel like, in a way, that's no kind hackling, of like crowdly. video, violent video games cause. I mean, it, that might, it might not help. I don't know if it's inviting people to, to walk up. But maybe we're going to have to start doing uh, comedy like uh, when the Blues Brothers went and performed oh, the Honky Kong. <laughs> yeah, right. Chain or, link fence. Or yes. in, uh, in uh, your beloved, uh, what's the fucking one with the cooler, with the, uh, the Swayze? Oh, Roadhouse? Roadhouse, yeah, yeah. they're performing behind uh, <laughs> Chicken Wire. That's right. Yeah, and also the comedy, yeah, the comedy, yeah, that was in Roadhouse. And speaking of the coolers, um, comedy, you know, clubs don't have the best coolers That's a good point. around. You know, the, the the guys who do the honky-tonks and the roadhouses oh, and the clubs and coolers. stuff, they're career coolers. These guys, I mean, when we had a crazy person a, a couple of times oh, had a crazy really? person out there mm. once at Cobbs, once uh, out the girl in Ventura. That got kicked out. yeah it, it, it takes a they do not snap into action no they're a little they're nowhere more, to be found they're they're nowhere to be found so maybe they're gonna have to step up yeah. that game a little bit you know what's interesting that, that I observed casually on Twitter just re seeing responses people you know tweeting about the incident and then was actually put into statistical so uh, Chris you have to dig for this so maybe don't even worry about it but someone took like did a scientific survey basically of like uh, 2,000 people women generally uh, or Will Smith is more is more um, uh, uh, defended or supported by women, and Chris Rock is more uh, defended and supported by men. 
Hmm. Men tend to come down on the side of Chris Rock. Lame. Well, not 100%, of course, but the, uh, it, it skews. Well, it's interesting because you know who else weighed in on this? And I read the whole thing, and it was actually it was really well done, especially because I've been watching Winning Time. I don't know if you're caught up yet. Not yet. But, well, um, I missed the last one. But Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wrote a whole article on Substack, and I'm it's long. I'm just going to read you the second sentence in the first paragraph. With a single petulant blow, he advocated violence, diminished women, insulted the entertainment industry, and perpetuated stereotypes about the black community. And he supports each of those in really succinct paragraphs. Well, I was talking to Drew about this earlier as well. And in his book, I guess, or in an interview, Will Smith said he was beat on a lot as a kid. In his book, I think. Uh, Listen... When you beat on kids, that becomes their conflict resolution, becomes putting hands on somebody else. We've seen a lot of this. We should probably focus on not beating on the kids. Uh, It's A, it's bad for the kids. It's worse for society because at some point this kid's going to take public transportation and we're going to get into a disagreement and then the hands are going to come out. There's no doubt that the epidemic of people putting their hands on people is also a byproduct of parents putting their hands on kids. And it's, it's a two way street. You never do that to your kid and your kid doesn't do that to other people. You don't think to do it. It's, it's, it's right. It's not part. It's, it's like you grow up eating poi. You like poi. You don't grow up eating poi. You hate poi. It's, it's not something that, Drew's kids or my kids would think about because nobody put their hands on them. It doesn't doesn't pop in your mind. Yeah, and I could be wrong because I just heard an expert on the ra- excerpt on the radio, but I think it also said he had a lot of experience watching his dad hit his mom. I would and say we're talking that's about another his wife, right? If so dad him. whacking on mom, dad whacking on you, and then you whack on society. Now Will Smith is you're not known for that. But. He is. He, he's in a pr- pretty rarefied air, yeah. but I'm talking about your average person right. Right. who experienced that and conflict resolution. And it's something that should be discussed. We can't discuss it because it takes a racial turn, so no one will bring it up. So then people will just continue to suffer. Well, ironically, guess who else supports Chris Rock, which mm. I was kind of tickled by? Uh, Alec Baldwin. Mm. He chimed in uh, about the smacking, and he said, I am not much... Uh, I'm not reading much about how or even if producers attended to Chris, but I love you, Chris Rock. I love that he was against somebody getting punched because I know sometimes he lets his fist do the talking. Do you guys yeah. notice that uh, they included the uh, cinematographer who died on Rust? Oh, the, oh Helena the Hutchins. Yeah. The, um, I'm not an attorney, but I always hear Mark Garagos' head. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my head, I hear his voice, and I always think, don't, don't, don't chime in for a little while, yeah. Alec. Take a little break from chiming in. Go do your movie in Italy. If someone wants to talk to you with their camera and their phone out, and when you leave the country store, don't talk to them. Yeah. Don't sit down with George Stephanopoulos. Like, <laughs> don't do any of that. Stop chiming in. Well, how about we divert the, that news about Alec Baldwin and talk about some new Alec Baldwin news. He and Hilaria are expecting their seventh child. That was shared in news in an Instagram post on Tuesday. Um, and there was a video, and I think we have it. You can just see that she's telling the kids or whatever, and they're all sort of excited and hugging. Um, she is 38. He's 63. They got Maria Lucia, Victoria, Carmen Gabriela, Rafael Thomas, Leonardo Angel Charles, Romeo Alejandro David, and Eduardo Pau Lucas. And uh, got another one coming in the fall. No one named Nick. Mm. And I have a little nod of Told the head to Dutch. his heritage, you know? Yeah. 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 Where's the uh, Pat? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Balance it out a little. Yeah. Wow. Is she having the kid? Or are they using a surrogate? Unclear, because I did do a little digging on that. And um, they list the ages, and one of them's 13 months, and one of them's 18 months. Mm. So they are using surrogates for at least one. So, and she looks, I mean, she's in, she's in fighting shape, what? so that would get lead me to believe. Now, do they both want more kids equally, or is that her thing or is that his thing? Because well, I feel like they have enough kids. He has kids from previous right. marriages. So what is it? Well, I'm, my first thought is he's Irish Catholic. They're used to big families. This isn't shocking to him. Yeah, but Alec, you got two brothers you hate. <laughs> or at least one and a half. Like, do the math. Mm-hmm. 
you got seven kids here. One and a half of them is going to be good. No. The other is going to be trouble. Yeah. The other is going to be Steven. But then look at Steven. He came back strong with his offspring. Right, with Haley Bieber. Because then she married Bieber, and now now you've you've made a comeback. Gravy train. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, Oh, this is very scary, especially since none of them seem to care. Um, We haven't talked about Ukraine in a while, but I want to talk about this very specific thing that happened. Russian soldiers who seized the site of Chernobyl, of the nuclear disaster, drove armored vehicles without radiation protection through a highly toxic zone called the Red Forest. And I'll tell you why it's called that in a minute. Kicking up clouds and radioactive dust. This is according to workers that work at Chernobyl. The two sources uh, said soldiers had been in this convoy. They didn't use any anti-radiation gear, anything that you... They basically said there's a suicide mission because anything you breathe in, breathe in has radiation dust. Um, they also said that they'd witnessed Russian tanks moving through the Red Forest, which is the most radioactively contaminated part of the zone. A vast area around Around Chernobyl is off limit, limits to anyone who doesn't work there or have special permission. But the Red Forest is so highly contaminated, even the plant workers, the nuclear plant workers, aren't allowed there. And they're just rolling through with, you know, a helmet and fatigues. God, I've heard stories about, like I heard a story about Ukrainian uh, soldiers shooting <laughs> captured Russians, like in the legs. Now there's this. And And the Russian, the Russian, uh, sorry, I didn't have it here, but uh, a Russian convoy ran over their superior. Their own superior. Yeah, it it is just a shit show. Uh, But you you would assume it was always this way. I mean, World War II was probably chock-a-block filled with these kind of atrocities and save the nuclear stuff. And then World War I, you know. I was I was thinking about this the other day, and I don't know why my brain always works this way. But you know, we we always go we're the only nation to ever nuke another nation. But true. But to be fair, we nuked ourselves first. No. <laughs> I mean, we did. We number of islands. We've, we've the Bikini Islands. Mm-hmm. We've nuked much of Nevada. We did a lot of self nuking. <laughs> You know, we were testing, but right. we were nuking. Yeah. We've there's you know, it's like there there's a couple places nukes have been set off and those places are Nagasaki and Hiroshima and Nevada. <laughs> but the Russians must have tested their nukes too. Oh you'd imagine so, yeah, probably parts of Siberia yeah. or Yeah, and did they test Aleutian Islands? We took a whole island. Right. They had people on it. That's right. We got them off. <laughs> That'll show them to live there. Also, I didn't think to pull this because there's no audio. But please tell me, and anyone can Google this. It is so worth it. Have you seen the little mini movie that Kim Jong... Which one? Not Sun. Kim Jong Il. Kim Jong... Which one is it now? Just say Kim Jong. Kim Jong. uh, Ken Jong. Um, (laughs) Did you see his new missile movie he put together? I I want to to talk about Dr. Ken for a second. (laughs) Totally different person. Uh, Well, let me just digress here. He's doing another one of those commercials for eye drops. Uh-huh. You can see him driving around. He's driving around a convertible. And he's like, oh, my eyes are so dry. Well, get a coupe next sure. time, Ken. But get a roof on that he, he takes his things off. And then we go into his head and we got the fire noid who's attacking. I I don't want the fungus noid <laughs> going after using my big toe nail like a hatch. Uh, yeah. I don't want the noid in my yeah. eye. I want a moratorium on crazy animated little like noids, the little devils. That you don't are, want your gross afflictions personified. Yes. Or they're in your bowel. They're in your stomach. Oh, the mucus noid. There's the mucus family guy. Yeah. I, no, no, no more noids. I'm, I'm trying to eat here, people. Yeah. Moratorium. They're moving in. Their whole family's moving. Yeah, here's... Here's Ken, Dr. Ken. Pulls off. Griffith probably. Dry eye symptoms keep driving eyes. you crazy? I think it's Jaguar. Inflammation in your eye might be to blame. <laughs> Let's oh, keep yeah. Ken's Oh my God. It's gear. syndrome from fucking yeah. Incredibles. <laughs> yeah. I would say the makers of Mr. Heat Miser <laughs> have, a, have a copyright case here. Oh, I forgot about Mr. Heat Miser. Find a picture of Mr. Heat Miser. I think That's they, nearly identical. I think they ripped wow. off Mr. Heat Miser from the from the uh, Rudolph cartoon. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, stop it. We get it. You can have a dry eye. Yeah. You can have a gut problem. You can have mucus. You can have fungus on your nails. Without it a does gremlin. not all need to be illustrated by a gremlin. Yeah. You're freaking me out. 
Agreed. Sorry, video. Oh, do you guys, do you have the video of the Kim Jong-un? It's pretty, have you not seen this? It's mm-hmm. Michael Bay to shame. Yeah, this is literally just his announcement that they have a missile. Set us to Armageddon soundtrack. So feel free to narrate. Walking out. In his little motion. outfit. His outfit. Shout out to someone. Pointing at things. Not dressed in military. Shout out to someone else. He's in like a leather members only jacket. There's a giant missile behind him. Do you know, I'm going to say this is phallic. Oh, very. Mm. <laughs> this is like on state run TV. Now he's looking at his watch. Oh, They're all looking at their watch, trying to scare us. Hans Zimmer's like, what am I done? <laughs> They're all looking at their watch for the countdown. And it feels a little too much on the watch. Takes the sunglasses off, gives a little nod, and oh. missile comes out. <laughs> oh, boy. This, isn't this, this is insane. I know. What year is it? What's going on? This is this is nuts. I, it, there's no way this is what 2022 was supposed no. to look like when when I was 14. And for somebody who claims to hate the West, he certainly wants to imitate blockbuster movies. You yeah. know what I mean? His influence pretty clear. Very influenced. Yeah, boy, that is uh, that is. Ugh. Jerk. One more thing to think about. Okay. Well, Sad. do you want we want one more happy story? Yeah, happy okay, story. Okay. So let's do a palate cleanser from kicking up radioactive dust and talk about Porsche. They've Ooh. announced that 80% of their cars will be electric by 2030. And the company's made a pledge to build a bunch of charging stations to make sure customers have a place to plug it in. Maserati also ramping up its electric car efforts with plans to go fully electric by 2025. O- electric cars work, they're fast. 2025 fully electric? That's what it says. <clears throat> they I mean, have how many Maseratis are there? Much smaller fleet. But Still, that's surprising. Electric cars, zero to 60, are quicker than any supercar with an internal combustion engine. At least they're capable of it. It's awesome. It's just the difference in the science between the instant torque of the electric motor and the internal combustion engine. So performance-wise, no Not problemo. Problem. And then uh, range-wise, we're getting into no problemo zone. And then there was this other part, which was kind of a, well, I like the sound. Right. You, you know what I mean? And that's true. Everyone over 45 likes the sound. But my son's not going to care about sure. no. the sound. So there's this whole new generation yeah. that's coming up that would, would have been like reading the news on a computer. I want a newspaper in my hand. What if <laughs> Something a, I can touch. What if a fly lands on me? <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah. F- what do I smack the $5 dog with? dollars for a bottle of water. I got a sink over there. It's free. You yeah. know, it's like, yeah, you're dying. Yeah. And then the, you shall be replaced by these people. I had this argument with a friend when the when the Keurig first came out. You know, the coffee pods. Yeah. You make the coffee instant. And me and uh, me and my buddy uh, Rich Demiro were like, it's great. It's every advantage is in favor of the Keurig. And he's like, well, what about I'm like? No, it's better with the Keurig. What about no? It's better. And finally, guys, like, well, what if I want to make a pot of coffee and sit on my balcony and read and, and pour from the pot? Well, yes, I guess in that in that right. specific instance, yes, I suppose. It's I've never better. had a Keurig. It's, oh, it's, it's good. I hear, but th- I know it doesn't make a difference, and I'm just one person. But hearing about the, all that landfill shit with the pods, I'm like, what's wrong with the it's, coffee pod? It's potted up. Trader Joe's makes mesh ones. Uh, ah, like, back in business, baby. Yeah. yeah, it's it's good. I I would say if you really like hanging out and drinking coffee, you can make the pot mm. in the morning if you're gonna be hanging out. And you be putzing right. around. That's uh, a but rare if you, scenario. But if you're getting up and going, single cup is fine. Single cup is the Keurig for me kicks in of uh, oh, it's been a long day, and I come home, and now I want to work out or exercise mm-hmm. or something. And I'm feeling tired. Mm-hmm. Just single cup, pow. I get it. Mm-hmm. I like it. Yeah, and uh, I, look, obviously with gas at six seventy five <laughs> a gallon, half the places in L.A. the the electric thing. Feels pretty enticing, but and again, we need the infrastructure. Depending on your neighborhood, I, Brian, I don't even know if you'll be able to relate. Adam, to harken back to yesteryear, I don't need a bunch of bros zooming by setting off every car alarm on my street. So oh. if you want to go electric, oh. by all means, go electric. I've, yeah. been, I've been there. I lived on Washington Boulevard, for God's sake. Gotcha. The, what, what's going to happen, sadly, is you know for every action, there's the reaction, and 
for every Prius, there's a big Ram pickup truck sure. being sold. There's James Brolin. <laughs> the more electric cars that get sold, the more douchebags are going to go with the open headers Full going down things. the street. They're going to let you know, even if you're asleep inside your condo, <laughs> they're going to let you know they are not part of this group that was forced into an electric car. Okay. All right, let's bring her home. You. <laughs> I, wow. The eye drop devil and uh, the heat miser are almost identical. I look, you can't just throw fucking aviator goggles <laughs> on something and call it your own. There should be a lawsuit here. Yeah. I now need a syndrome. Mr. Uh, Mr. Heat Miser. He had a song. You remember? Yeah, the of course. And was it Mr. Snow Miser? Mr. Heat I'm Mr. Heat Miser. Miser. I'm He's Mr. Miser. 101. Miser. Bob. Bop, 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 the, bop, the, bop. the fact that that was one of the best parts of my childhood shows. Very sad. My friend John Tyler made a Mr. Heat Miser in my ceramics class, and somebody crushed it. <laughs> mean. With a fist. You know what I mean? Oh. Like, you know, he put it in the locker overnight and found a big fist in it. Oh. And then it set off a chain reaction. Because John didn't know who did it, but he had it narrowed down to like four people. You, Ray. So, right. So he went and smashed their shit. And then the person whose shit got smashed oh, thought it was somebody else and started smashing someone else's shit. And, uh, it's a metaphor for world relations. The biggest yeah. ticket item when you take ceramics is $10 for your big block of clay at the yeah. beginning of the semester. Then somebody threw mine out the second story window and landed on a drainage grate and fucked it all up. Then someone pushed number two pencils into mine. Oh. So Mr. Heat Miser over here just set this fucking chain reaction off where everyone was smashing everyone's projects and sabotage. It was like you spike, like like the Sierra Club spikes a tree. Right. I got my it's clay exactly spike. He is too All much. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad! That was the news with Gina Grad. Well, let me tell you about CBDX, Delta 8 THC, new cabinoids sweeping the hemp and health and wellness market. CBDX.com sells Delta 8 products, which uh, feel just like cannabis vape products, actual flower, gummies, even uh, concentrates. Legal per the uh, 2018 Farm Bill uh, Congress passed. Ships to 39 states. Use the code ADAM uh, for not only 20% off, but uh, free gram, a dry bud, with your first order. Orders ship within 24 hours. And there's only four letters you got to remember. CBDX.com. Promo code ADAM. Am I right, Dawson? Do not operate machinery when using these products. Please be responsible. All right. Uh, Yardley Smith from The uh, Simpsons. Voice of Lisa, of course, after since 1987. Amazing. We'll talk to her right after this. The Adam Carolla Show presents Yardley Smith's birthday cocktail party for July 3rd. Let's see who's invited. All rise for the King of France, Louis XI. The French explorer, Samuel de Champlain, just found the party. Gloria Allred's at the party, and she'll probably file suit. Johnny Lee is here, and he's still looking for love in all the wrong places. American humorist, Dave Barry, just joined the party. The California guitarist from that band called Little Feet, Paul Barrere. Temptation singer, Damon Harris. The former husband of one of the former housewives of Orange County, Matt Keough. Singer, Laura Branigan. Montel Williams is here. The founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange is here. We welcome actor, Patrick Wilson. Olivia Munn. And, hard deck my ass, we nailed that son of a bitch. Maverick, Tom Cruise just buzzed the tower. Yardley Smith is on the Adam Carolla Show. Good to see you, Yardley. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I rarely hear you interviewed, so I was very <laughs> much into uh, talking to you. That's so lovely. I have, um, I'm a big Simpsons fan. I go way back to the first time it aired. Yeah. I, was, I was in. On the Tracy Allman Show? 
No, I remember seeing it on the Tracy Ullman show, but it was not formed well enough or something to me back then. But as soon as it hit as its own series, I was I was all in. Yeah. How did that uh, for how did that all come about for you? Um, I so I didn't have a voiceover agent. I just had a theatrical agent, and I never wanted to do voiceover when I was planning my world domination sort of coup, and. Um, because I think because I had always been teased for having such a funny voice when I was a kid, and I just didn't think that I could parlay that sound into something really, really great. I was just going to have to work with it. It but seemed I wasn't like a gonna deficit. It, yeah, it did, very much so. I didn't really want to shine a light on it that much. But anyway, I had been working a lot in television. I'd actually done a, quite a few movies by the time I was I auditioned in 86, so I would have been uh, 22. And uh, I, my agent said, Yardley, go in and read for this cartoon. They're going to do these little bumpers on this sketch comedy show called The Tracy Ullman Show. And I was like, the what now? I said, what? What? So <laughs> I never said no to an audition, even though I didn't really want to do it. I just wasn't interested in doing a cartoon. It wasn't sort of a hard pass. I just thought, eh, who cares? So I went in and they showed me a picture of Bart. And I read for Bart, which which is sort of now has become this huge urban lore. It, there's much too much emphasis put on it. I read for Bart because they always have women do the voices of young boys because our voices don't change. Right. But it wasn't like Yardley Smith should do the voice of Bart. In fact, the woman who was casting The Simpsons at that time had seen me in a little play in Hollywood about a year before. Mm -hmm. And when they were casting The Simpsons on The Tracy Ullman Show said, I know who should play Lisa Simpson. So, so that's what I was called in. She, did she talk to your agent? Or? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you went in, uh, you did Lisa, you got the part, but these were shorts yes. on the Tracy Ullman show, so it probably didn't feel like much at it, the beginning. It didn't, and in fact, actually, I read for Bonnie Pietilo, who was our casting director, and then I had to go back and read for Matt Graining. And I remember reading for Matt, and he didn't laugh, and I thought, well, I guess I didn't get that job. So I just kind of let it roll off my back, um, which is, wasn't usually what happened with auditions when I didn't get it. I, was, I took things very hard, very personally, um, for a long time. So when I got the job again, I said, oh, that's fabulous. The, the job is what? We're doing what? And they're like, wow, you're going to tell a whole story in about a minute, and it's going to be four 20-second segments. So it's like a minute and 20 seconds, right? And we would go in at the end of a Tracy Ullman rehearsal day, and Dan Castellaneta, who was on the Tracy Ullman show, and Julie Kavner, who was also on the Tracy Ullman mm -hmm. show, had been tapped to play Homer and Marge, respectively. And they built a makeshift sound booth in the back of the audience bleachers, which wasn't really soundproof at all. And so we would go in at the end of their day and record The Simpsons. And, but invariably, Tracy would be having a, a music rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And so our not soundproof sound booth was just bullshit. We had to stop and wait for it to be done. And it was, it was all sort of spit and paste until we went to half hour. Um, and so you went to half hour and... Uh, 87? 89, actually. So two years on the Tracy Ullman show, and then we spun off into Half Hour in the very first Simpsons oh, episode. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I was confused because it says since voice of Lisa Simpson since 87, yes. which is true. But I was like, I know where I was when that first <laughs> out, when that first drop, but I wasn't thinking about Tracy Ullman. Yeah, yes. 89. And I we were, the first Half Hour episode to air was the Christmas special in December of 89. Yeah. I know, uh, I know where I was. I had gone to, I was trying to do comedy. We're the same age and I was trying to do comedy and I'm from Los Angeles and I, I just wasn't getting anywhere. And I had this thing in my head that you don't start doing comedy in Los Angeles. You, you come here. Ah, sure. But what happens when you're from here? <laughs> what do you do? How do you start? You How know? did you do it? Well, I was like, I have to find some place where I could go that has like a little scene where I could work out in a club. You know, you yeah. can't do that at the comedy store because <laughs> right. it's 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 like Eddie Murphy's coming next. You know, yes. that's so. I, I, but I romanticized it, and I I packed up my pickup truck because I was a carpenter. Found a friend who lived in the Bay Area, and. 
he lived in Oakland. He had a big old rented house. And like one of his roommates went to Europe for two months or something. I was like, I'll rent his room. I'll come there with my all my belongings in my pickup truck and I'll find some local club and I'll really work out. Yeah. Like I'll really <laughs> I'll get my shit together. I'll perform. I'll get all this stage time. And um I, I went out and I, I found this place called Roost, Rooster Tea Feathers, which is owned by some old woman who somehow knew my grandmother in a different life. And I she like it. put a call in for me. <laughs> and I drove out there and I and I bombed. And I was driving home over the bridge in a in a rainstorm, and I, I thought about driving off the bridge. Like, no. I was like, I want to kill myself. <laughs> and then I sat in this person's rental house. I couldn't find a place to do comedy. The Simpsons came on, yeah. and I was like, God damn, this show's funny. <laughs> and then I put my tail between my legs. I went right back to L.A. and begged to get another construction job. But I do remember where I was because I wasn't sitting where I normally sit. I was in someone else's house right. trying to figure out the rest of my life. And that's when the I saw my first Simpsons. That's amazing. Actually, your story sort of reminds me of Lewis Black. So mm. um, before Lewis Black was this huge comic, he was the resident comic at um, the West Bank Cafe in the basement. Mm -hmm. And I did a play of Lewis Black's when, so I grew up in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And right out of high school, I got a job. And that, and I got these wild, extraordinary reviews in all the papers from this sketch comedy show. And I got an audition at Arena Stage, which was like the best theater in D.C. that wasn't booking in Broadway shows. And they cast everybody from New York. But there I was, this local girl, and I had made this huge splash. And so while I was there, I did a couple of shows there. We did a reading of a play by Lewis Black called Hitchin. And wow. then that following summer, they did that play as a production at a summer festival theater in Ohio. And that's how I met Lewis Black, who became a lovely friend. And when I moved to New York right after that, he was very kind and welcoming. So you're on this makeshift sound booth under the bleachers at the Tracy Ullman <laughs> <Yes>. show. <laughs> She's doing musical stuff. Yes. She had a hit record. She has an incredible voice. Like that woman is so fucking talented. She is off the charts. So she just opened her mouth and this massive sound would come out. Yeah. Played all the different characters. And so somebody takes notice over at Fox and they think, well, let's spin this into a series and now it's a series. Now, are you excited? Are you dubious? How do you enter the the series? You think you can't imagine the success The Simpsons would have, but do you think we've got something here? I sort of never. I was. I felt like. Well, I I love my character. I know what I'm supposed to do here. I sort of would never try to project how something would go. I, I always, you always want it to be a success because as an actor, of course, your life is so um, unstable, really. It's so, um, there are no guarantees. And so uh, you're like, oh, great, half hour, sure. But I do remember hearing also, because we were this mid-season replacement, that the scuttlebutt around town was, this is never going to go. This will never fly. You guys are out of your mind. And also, by the way, Fox isn't even going to be a network in like six months. So good luck and good riddance. And they were saying, you haven't had a, a, a cartoon on in prime time since the Flintstones. You are all out of your fucking mind. And then we hit so big, so fast, right out of the gate. And I was surprised We when we started The Simpsons um, the actors didn't do any interviews. We didn't do any PR because they wanted those animated characters to exist as much as possible as mm -hmm. real people in their own right. So, um, and I don't also think they wanted anybody to know that Bart Simpson was voiced by a woman. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were sort of, we were very much behind the scenes. I think, I don't want to correct you, Chris can look, animated primetime... I think there was a cartoon animated primetime called Wait Till Your Father Gets Home. Oh, really? That, that may have after come the after the Flintstones. Oh, fantastic. Maybe the Flintstones were in the later 60s and maybe Wait Till Your Father Gets Home showed up in 74 or something. Had a two-year run. Yeah, and... 72 to 74. Oh, look at you. Produced by Hanna-Barbera. That's deep. 
Yeah. That's I don't want I'm not here to correct the no, guess. No, no, please. I I've been telling the Flintstone story for so long. I'm happy to be corrected. And all the young reporters you speak to don't go, <laughs> what about wait till your father gets home? No. What do you know? They don't. <laughs> Tom Bosley. <laughs> Tom Bosley. Was the voice. Wow. And the other guy was the other guy from Burns and Allen or something. Jack Burns. Jack Burns. Really? Remember Burns? Yeah. Oh, not Burns and Allen. Sorry, or, Burns and Shriver. Bur- oh, I did. Avery Shriver wow. and Jack Burns. We're a comedy That's deep. team. Yeah. Anyway, enough about them. <laughs> <laughs> they made it two seasons. You guys are on your what season now? Thirty-four. We just started recording season thirty-four. So it's a gift in every way. What? Oh my God! What? It it's it should be the dream. I mean, you tell me, but you know, show business is great. But it's oftentimes not that consistent. And sometimes when someone goes, oh, you want to buy this house or you want to do this thing? And you kind of go, I don't know. I got to wait to see if we get picked up <laughs> or right. what happens or, or whatever. So it's it's fantastic, but you miss a certain consistency. And then the consistency could be found working at the post office, but there's no excitement. Less there. creativity. I'd say what you're doing has... The creativity and the consistency that you normally never see. It's true. It's a dream. It, it truly is a dream job, not only for um, the security of it, but I actually genuinely love my character. She's, yeah. she's a, a great girl. She is so um, funny and uh, thoughtful and courageous and complicated she really, it's an honor. I just love that girl. Like, I love her like she's a living, breathing, three-dimensional, red-blooded little person. Yeah, and uh, in a world where we talk a little too much about role models, she is a, a good <laughs> role model. One of the, I think it was Lisa Goes to Washington, yes. I think it's one of my favorite earlier yes. episodes where there's a lot of truth there and a lot of comedy there and a lot, a lot you'd like your girl. Yes. To learn from? Yes, absolutely. So the process um, is what? Like, I'm always interested in, um, yeah, I was just interviewing Bill Maher, and I was like, um, real time, what's yeah. the schedule? You know, like, how does it work? I, I, I asked Tucker Carlson, how does it work? It's like, I get up, I take a sauna, I take a piss out in the bushes. He lives <laughs> in a guest house. Then I start writing the opening monologue. And I'm like, I'm, I'm very interested in the process. Bill had his own, you know, Monday morning, I start blah, blah, blah. And then I meet with the writers on Tuesday. How does, what is the day for you when you're in season and the process with the Simpsons? So before the pandemic, we used to do a table read all together. We mm-hmm. would meet in a conference room on the 20th Century Fox lot, and all the writers would be there, all the actors, and then our showrunners like to have an audience. So there's probably about 60 people sitting around the edges of this big conference room. Who are they comprised of? They are you, friends of, you know, the writers, or if you're lucky, a friend of a friend, somehow you manage to get your butt on the lot and found mm-hmm. a parking place. And now you've, now you get to be in this room. Um, and it's the first time that the writers hear the script out loud, read by the actors, and really the only time they'll hear it in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. So we read it. We see what the reactions are. If you watch the writers, they tick in the margins, jokes that worked, little X's if it didn't. Um, They make little notes if somebody like Dan Castellaneta does an ad lib or Hank or somebody like that. Um, And then we go away, the actors, and and the writers meet and they start the rewrite process. We used to record that episode the following Monday, so basically four days later. Mm -hmm. That turned out to be uh, a little bit rushed, although it took us probably 25 years to figure that out. Now we record it 10 days later on a Monday, and we, before the pandemic again, we used to get all together like an old radio play. Everybody who's in town and record it, do each scene four times. Then if it's still not what they need, you do pickups for various lines and then move on. We'd no longer take a lunch break, so it's a pretty well-oiled machine, pretty streamlined process from 10 to 2.30-ish. We go away, they cut together the best of what they got that day, send it off to the animators. Then it takes about eight months to animate one episode. So you would always do... 
a group read. Yes. I mean, it would always, you, the conversation yes. wouldn't be, I mean, I've done a little bit of animated work. The hell was I in? Wreck It Ralph, mm. maybe a few other things. Yeah. You, you just go in and lay your stuff down and leave. That's you don't the know way who you're talking is. to. Right. Yes. But they they understood the the audience and the everyone together in the same room. There was an energy that that lifted the product up. Very much so. And that's all James L. Brooks, who comes from Mary Tyler Moore, New Heart. <clears throat> Um, you know, and then of course it's all his taxi, or taxi right. and his Academy Award winning movies as well. But his thing was just because nobody sees you, Yardley, your face or Nancy or Dan or Julie doesn't mean we're not going to do this like a regular sitcom that would be on camera in front of an audience. Mm-hmm. That's how you get the best product. So that's what we're doing. How does it work with the guests? Uh, you know, everyone has done a voice on, on The Simpsons. Everyone except for me, actually. So <laughs> I'll put in a good word. I support the show, <laughs> but my phone never rang. But um, And then we got to talk about the alleged Michael Jackson nice. one. It was always a lot of weird rumors that that was a Michael Jackson impersonator. Or he did one, the, it's the big guy in the insane asylum mm-hmm. one. So don't let me... Forget to circle back to that. But what do you do when the guest comes? Is is gonna are they a part of it? How we do they we do? always want them to be a part of it. Sometimes they they'll even come to a read through. Like Anne Hathaway has been on a couple times. She came and sat at the table with us. Um, we recorded with Lady Gaga several years ago, and she actually came to the record, and that was awesome. Certainly, as technology has evolved, it's been much easier if there's a you know, a, a quiet room and a, and a digital recorder, you can pick them up wherever they are across mm-hmm. the globe. Mm-hmm. Um, but you will lose. And, and occasionally, for instance, I just recorded with Billie Eilish. Mm-hmm. And she was in New York and I was in the studio in California. And so we were both on Zoom. And Jim Brooks really he insisted that I come to her session because, again, as you say, there's no substitute for that energy. And even though Zoom is kind of a comedy killer. <laughs> At least it's better than nothing in this day and age. So Yeah, look, if you and I were having this conversation and one of us was on Zoom, even if it was technically perfect, it would drop twelve to sixteen percent yeah. or some or seven to fourteen percent or something. There's just a little it's a little percentage drop. Yes. Because at the end of the day, you're a human being, you're an animal, you need to kind of <laughs> experience that. I you know? agree. You need to smell my musk. <laughs> I do. I need that. <laughs> so, um, it, well, so you've had everybody, but who who were you? You know, you may have been less impressed by this person and, and more by that. Who are yeah. some of the people you've like been excited to meet? I, re- I mean, I really was excited to meet Lady Gaga. Um, and she was so gracious. Uh, she stood next to me in our little recording booth, which is probably about the size of this room here. Mm-hmm. Um uh, she was so game. She would, you know, we do every scene four times. And you, you have to explain that to people because even if the direction after you do the scene is, that was perfect, let's do it again. People right. are like, the what? You, what? I thought it was perfect. Like, well, here's the thing. So um, she was fantastic. Eric Idle mm-hmm. from Monty Python sure. was fabulous. Um, Ricky Gervais has been on a couple times and he was really fun and he wrote he wrote his episode as I recall and he also wrote a song for it and so he played it live in the studio. I was flown to New York very early on in the series to record with Dustin Hoffman. Oh, he played the school teacher. Yes. He played the school teacher you had a crush on. That's right. And that was I've a seen huge these episodes. day. You really have. That it That's was, one of my favorites of all time. Oh, he dressed like a cowboy. Yeah, yeah. 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 I forgot that was yeah. that was him. That was a fe- really one of the I think one of the best days yeah, of my Lisa career. You know, has a crush on her because her teacher. she's finally seen by a grown up. Right, she has mm-hmm. this sort of this misunderstood relationship with her own father, who really doesn't get her. Of course, he loves her, but he doesn't really get her. And so, Lisa finally connecting with a, an adult male who. It's like, hey, I'm in your corner. You're fabulous. I see all your talents. It was like, what? So that was a big deal. Yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a touching episode. It was very sweet. Yeah, he played Mr. Bergstrom. Yes. Lisa's yes. Substitute was the name of the <laughs> episode. So I'm reading it from the oh, screen. I'm not, look at you. I'm not that good, but <laughs> I, I do remember that. 
<laughs> as being a really good. And it must have been, and that was early on. Season two. Season yeah. two. So yeah. you were not nobody, but Dustin Hoffman was somebody. He was, he was a big deal. And you got flown out to record with him. Yeah. It must have been tougher getting A-listers early if they weren't a fan of the show. Yes. Now yes. it's ubiquitous. You get to have Lady Gaga and Billy Eilish and stuff because it's The Simpsons. You right. know what I mean? But this is before it was The Simpsons or close to it. We uh, oftentimes, even if the if the adult hadn't seen the show or wasn't a fan, if their kids were, oh, then that was a shoe in. You're so damn you know. right. So we'll do anything for those pretty little much. shits. Yeah. And you find out, yeah. <laughs> no, it's true that you do all their bidding. Like I, yeah. I did that. <laughs> I, uh, my kids loved um, Modern Family. Next thing you know, it's like, oh, here we go. We're going there. We're going to watch a table read. We're going to sit on the set and take a picture. But yeah, it was all them. Of sort course. of the impetus behind all your life, this stuff. They run your life, don't they? Yeah. yeah. You say run or ruin. Either one will work. You know. So, <laughs> Depending on the day. <laughs> so you're 20, uh, you're like 26 at this point. At a young. Oh, yeah. I was young. I and was, you're yeah. going off to hang out with Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. And um, and again, like be in the same room and really like work with him. And and with James L. Brooks, you know, he's uh, he directed us that day. And Jim doesn't now he'll occasionally direct, but he he didn't direct every show even back in the day. But when he would, you just you know, it just was like work. It was just two really big deals. And I was like, hi, here, hi, that's just me, Yardley. Well, when the thing when the Simpsons exploded and they really took off and they they it wasn't a thing like there's certain shows like i don't know something like entourage it was like it was like around for like three seasons before people started to go oh yeah i've heard of that you know simpsons like kind of out of the gate boom simpsons pow simpson mania it was but then you're kind of, they're kind of telling you not to do the circuit. Don't go on the late night shows and let's not reveal who yes. you are. Is that frustrating or difficult? Was it like, this is in the contract, you don't do it? Or was it like, we have a gentleman's agreement or I don't want to expose the character either? Or what was that? What I was think, that like? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty um, agreeable person. I, I, I was, I'm a recovering people pleaser, so if they were like, Yardley, you're not going to go on. Also, I don't think like Letterman and Carson back in the day were like, hey, let's get Yardley Smith on the show. Um, they were much more interested in having Matt Groening on the show. Um, I, I, I don't know. It's a, I, I, I don't remember feeling um, resentful about it. I don't remember feeling left out i think i i i my focus was still so much on my on camera career which was really robust throughout the first 12 years of my career as i was as i was coming up from about 17 to maybe 30 um i was like okay all right whatever it wasn't that i couldn't mention it in interviews but i also it, it, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like they weren't calling anyway. It was like, okay, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> you were in, uh, let's see. God, Emilio Estevez. Was that Maximum, Maximum Overdrive? Overdrive. <laughs> a truck, a clown devil truck is possessed by an alien? I, I can't remember. Was, a comet passes through Earth's atmosphere and all the machines go haywire. Well, most. And, and, then and there Stephen King a, directed that one. It's oh. from a Stephen King short story, and yeah. he directed it. The only film he ever directed. Oh, it is? Yeah. It makes sense, because I think Stephen King wrote Duel. Did he write Duel? Oh, no. That's, uh, sorry, that's uh, Spielberg. I may have done Duel. I'm trying to think. Remember the movie Duel? No. I think it was a TV movie. It was a big pickup truck. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the whole thing was funny. It, okay. It was a big 18-wheeler. And Dennis Weaver is driving down a mountain road and this truck's like up his ass the entire time. They never showed the truck driver. They never showed a person in the truck. It was just this kind of possessed 
Man in a Truck. <laughs> yeah, it was directed by Spielberg, written by Richard Matheson, who wrote like I Am Legend and oh. Twilight Zone episodes and things like that. It was it was an entire feature length movie, but it was just one diesel truck, one eighteen wheeler chasing okay. around Dennis Weaver. I don't know. That's, Sorry for the yeah. deep. Yeah. Directed by so Steven good. Spielberg in his feature length directorial debut. See? Go and Chris. then there's a show called Wait Till Your Father Gets Home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a one-upper in my truck movie stories. Totally this predated are. Maximum Overdrive, by the way. A lot, th- a lot of things did. <laughs> so uh, you're on to this thing. You don't have to wait. There's no steeping process. It's a big hit, uh, you know, right out of the box. Everyone loves it. And you have this character that is... Uh, you know, the least cartoonish, uh, arguably, out of any character in The Simpsons. I mean, yes, all all of them, even, you know, uh, and and I, you know, we got to talk about Phil Hartman. I mean, mm. I, I mean, Troy McClure and that yes. kind of stuff. I, it makes me laugh. He's so great. Was uh, so were the guys like uh, Phil Hartman, were they just there? When you guys were there? Yeah, they would come. He would come to table reads when his characters showed up. Mm -hmm. And so it was, I mean, it was much easier back then, I think, to get guests to come because you didn't have the kind of digital access that you have now to record anywhere, really. Mm -hmm. So, um, but if they couldn't come, for instance, when um, Paul McCartney and Linda McCartney were on, Lisa Mm -hmm. the Vegetarian, Mm -hmm. and they only came on because they said, we'll only do it if you if you promise that Lisa Simpson will remain a vegetarian for the rest of the series. Mm -hmm. And I think they were on in like season eight or something. Mm -hmm. And we were like, okay, no problem. We're on for two more years. That'll be great. Now it's been a hundred thousand years. And so I did not get to record with them. Sadly, uh, our showrunner at that time, David Merkin got to go to Surrey, England and record with them in their private studio. I was like, well, what the fuck? What am I? Chef livery. You're not going to take me to rats. What are some of your favorite episodes? (laughs) Um, or even thoughts. non-Lisa centric yeah, yeah. episodes. Um, one of my favorites that's not a, a Lisa episode is uh, Bart sells his soul. Oh yeah, it's so brilliant! It's so brilliant. I, 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 there was a sort of morality in a lot of them. Yeah, like, like when uh, remember uh, one of my favorites is uh, Homer steals cable. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to rip off the cable company and yes. get stuff for free. And you, were, yes. you, Lisa was kind of his conscience. You were like the angel, right? And Bart was kind of the devil, of course, on his his shoulder. Uh, I love well when uh, Marge went to uh, Rancho Relaxo. Yes, uh, and um, I think my all timer is uh, Homer trying to get morbidly obese so he can stay home from work, <laughs> work from home. <laughs> That's funny. I remember thinking like, oh, come on. Now I think that now Homer's just become so, so, too, too. Um, but I think I'm sort of alone in my camp there. Did you uh, offer input to some of the things Lisa would say? Did you ever get to those things? You know, in the writer's room, we go like, I don't think she would say that. Or here's an alternative thing. We, uh, you know, actors didn't really, we don't really wander into the writer's room Um it's not that they we wouldn't be welcome, but I actually did go into the writer's room again pre-pandemic just to sort of see, like, I've never been in here. I want to see how it goes. And everybody just, it was like, oh, no, oh, no, there's a shark among the minnows. Mm-hmm. Like, they just totally shut down. We're like, now what? And they couldn't pitch any jokes. I was like, okay, I'm going to go. I just, you guys are awesome. I just wanted to sort of be a fly on the wall. You can't really do that. I And I understand that. It's a very, um, I think it's a sacred space for them. But I will say, if we get to the record and they have Lisa Simpson say something or somebody says or does something to Lisa and she has no retort or no recourse for that where especially if somebody's being really mean to her i always speak up i always have to fight that battle i might not win it but i gotta fight it the uh now the michael jackson episode it's john j smith is credited (laughs) yes as the happy birthday lisa song yeah 
I didn't, I didn't have any inside connections. I just heard, was it Michael Jackson? Wasn't it Michael Jackson? So Michael Jackson did the lines for the role mm-hmm. as the overweight guy in the insane, uh, insane asylum. asylum. And um, he came and recorded with us. He was totally all about just it. Just showed up at the table. He, uh, he didn't come to the table. He came to the record a mm-hmm. few days later. Mm-hmm. And uh, But he, for some reason, I heard it was there was some contractual reason why he couldn't sing on the show. Mm-hmm. So he literally handpicked a Michael Jackson sound-alike named Kip Lennon, who then had to come to the record, sing as Michael Jackson in front of Michael Jackson. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We need to hear that, Chris. <laughs> and, and maybe a little Michael from that episode. So this would have been That was early. early. I want to say like season three or four because it was around the time that we did a, an album called The Simpsons Sing the Blues. And mm. Michael Jackson wrote a song called Do the Bartman with, um, I think, sure. DJ Jazzy Jeff. So, oh, my God. Yeah. So <laughs> what phase... Was Michael Jackson in at that point? Like, was he dressed in whatever we picture him yes. being dressed in? Because his, his hair changed, his nose changed, his outfits changed. Like, he was, there was a stage for yes. Michael. I remember he wore a fedora, He and he was wearing those, um, you know, high water pants, for lack of a, mm-hmm. a I don't know, floods, that's what we, we used to call them, them floods, um, and his you know, black dress shoes mm-hmm. and a, a button up shirt, buttoned up to the neck and a little jacket. And he was very soft spoken, very shy, very polite. He was he was a pleasure that day. So he showed up as Michael Jackson. He did. And so it so he did do all the voiceover work yeah. on that, but his label probably said you're contractually obliged. Which I don't can't. get, because it wasn't like he was singing one of his own songs. He, he was singing a song that the writers wrote for him based on <laughs> tune to Lisa, to Happy Birthday almost. So that part I kind of, I always thought like, really? I wonder how he knew his Michael Jackson impersonators. I mean, I guess you would, but... He or knew... or he auditioned them. I don't know what that how Kip Lennon came into his sphere, but the dude had and it was Kip Lennon is a lovely we actually when we did the Hollywood Bowl, Kip Lennon came on stage and sang Lisa It's Your Birthday mm. with Nancy Cartwright as Bart and they sang it to me as I sat on stage. And Kip Lennon, Lennon is the loveliest um slender white guy singing <laughs> as Michael Jackson. Well here's <laughs> here's Michael Jackson dialogue. So Michael Jackson's just sitting there yeah. watching him. And isn't that uncanny? I mean, I think Kip Lennon, hats off to you, my friend. And now he's in Ambrosia. That's crazy. Yeah, also <laughs> delicious salad. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> well, speaking of food. Yes. I was watching some of your cooking videos oh. last night. <laughs> yes. Let's see. I created a cooking show during the pandemic because I needed some dumb entertainment for troubling times. The grated butter... <laughs> On the sourdough toast was a stroke of genius. Thank you. Thank you. I have that problem. It's cold. <laughs> it's a pad. You roll it. It's hard to spread. Yeah. You, you grate it. Tear your, butter, tear, tear your bread. Nobody wants that. Mm-hmm. You got to grate that shit. Yeah. And uh, is that just uh, uh, the pandemic is in full swing and I'm bored of shit and I'm at home and I need to perform? Uh, yes. Some of that. I'm um, also a really good cook. So I thought there are a lot of cooking shows well, there the network cooking shows are about people who don't know are who do know how to cook, and then there are a lot of shows also about people who don't know how to cook. And I thought, well, I do know how to cook, and I'm just going to put my own spin on it. So I started out combining ingredients that would never go together, and that show is called Oil and Water. Right. And then I got tired of putting sardines in my ice cream, so mm. I sort of progressed into a show I now call Stupid Good. Mm-hmm. Um, still Oil & Water presents Stupid Good, where I take recipes I've never made before that look really great and hope that when I make them, they'll be stupid good. Is uh, all the cast members, and we're on uh, year uh, 32, 33? 34. 34 coming? Yeah. <laughs> um, everyone's still around, right? Yes. And now, who's passed? Has anyone passed? Marsha Wallace passed. She played Mrs. Oh, Krabappel. that's right. Bart's teacher. Um, Marsha Wallace from Bob Newhart. Yes. The big 
redhead. Yes, yes. Yeah, she was great. She was amazing. Also, Rusi Taylor, mm. who played um, Uter. She played a number of the boys in uh, mm-hmm. Bart's and Lisa's classes. She also was Minnie Mouse. She is a legend. Mm. Um, and uh, Jackie Mason, who played Krusty's dad. Oh, the great Jackie Mason, who just passed, I think. A couple, right? couple years ago? I don't know. Or I less? don't think it's been less. Mm. He was a character. That's right. But, you know, sort of ancillary. <laughs> I mean, Mrs. Kravapal was, was in she yes. was in there. But, she was way in there. But it, it is kind of interesting, not in a, necessarily in a morbid way, but um, the, the main body of the cast and, and many of the behind-the-scenes people all, all remain 30-some-odd years later. Yes, except Sam Simon. Sure. Yeah. Sam and what was Sam's role there? Like, what? So he was really instrumental, and the show went to half hour. In um, Jackie died in two thousand twenty-one. Oh wow! Jackie Mason, yeah, wasn't that long ago? Not that long ago. Um, he so Sam Simon was very instrumental in running. I think the writers' room. Now we have two writers' rooms, but mm-hmm. at the time there was one, and Sam was while he didn't write a lot of scripts from scratch, he was a brilliant developer slash editor. Mm-hmm. And he came to every record and he would always, you know, put his two cents in. And he was a he was a huge part of the development piece, which is why he's still credit credited in the developed by card with Jim Brooks, Matt Groening and Sam Simon. Do you, what is your most popular say this if you run into someone who recognizes <laughs> you? You must have those. Yeah, I do. Uh, sadly, Lisa Simpson, one of the jokes is she doesn't really have a catchphrase. Maybe the closest thing is, I'll be in, <clears throat> I'll be in my room. Right. You know, or yeah. Bart, quit it. Bart, quit it. <laughs> but Bart has about 12 catchphrases, so it's, it's rather unbalanced. Um, yes, it's true. So if they ask me to do the voice of Lisa Simpson, I always ask them, what's your name? If you know, And you say, my name is Adam. Say, Hi, Adam. It's Lisa Simpson. How are you? And it always gets that reaction. People, You can't help but smile when Lisa Simpson greets you. Well, look, if the whole shithouse comes down, you got a career <laughs> in Cameo. Man. You know what's funny? The amount of money you could make on Cameo. Except that I can't do it as Lisa Simpson. Oh, you don't own the voice? I don't own the voice. Literally don't own the voice. But what if you said, uh, hi, this is Cisa Limpson. (laughs) And I want to wish a happy birthday to Fred. (laughs) Sure. It's funny because... It's the same if I went off to do another animated show or film or something like that. As long as she could sound similar to Lisa Simpson, but the attitude would have to be quite different. Like there would have to be very distinct differences Mm -hmm. in order for me not to get into hot water up to my eyeballs. What are the also the chances, you know, normally hear all these stories. I I watch a lot of documentaries about bands and things like Mm -hmm. that. You know, I was just interviewing uh, Gene Simmons from Kiss. I, I heard that one. He, oh, good. He must have been on The Simpsons at some point. He might have been. I, You know, honestly, since we don't get to meet everybody, sometimes you don't even know who they got until the show airs. You're like, oh, God, oh, look at that. But, you know, so <laughs> what, what I was saying is, is, you know, you got Kiss, they're the biggest band in the world, and then there are one or two guys in the band that just they, they, don't, they, they think they should be in a bigger band or they don't like taking orders from this guy <laughs> or they've got a career and dance or something. You know what I mean? Like, it's very, it happens to bands all the time. You can't find four people, put them together, have them have a bunch of success without one ass wipe going, well, fuck it, I'm better than this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be produced by my girlfriend and we're doing a solo album. How is it the, simp- the, the, the core cast of, I don't know, five, six, six, six yeah. people, not one of them got like a weird, um, headstrong, too big for their britches, I'm going to go solo, you know, like they all just stayed together. Yeah, Very we rare. Also, it is rare. I, I do think, not that we don't all really um, respect each other, but we don't actually socialize we're all quite different and quite busy. And so I do think that part of the sort of harmony has to do with the fact that we're only together five hours a week 
when we're in season, right? And not even every week because we take hiatuses and stuff. So, and we just do the work, right? There, nobody, there were no affairs. There's never been any, anything like that. So in some ways we just sort of stayed in one lane, all of us. Mm -hmm. And, um, so just you and Dustin Hoffman, but not you (laughs) and anyone in the cast. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So it's, uh, it's been, it's been good that way. I think, but I also have a saying that money makes you more of who you already are. Mm-hmm. So if you are already generous and kind and um, grateful before you got a lot of money, then you'll be that way after you get money. If you came from a place of scarcity and lack and like there's never enough for me and you get a lot of money, you'll still feel that way. Yeah. So is it, speaking of money, is it favored nations? Yes. So everyone gets paid the same. Yes, after about after that happened after about season nine. That helps. Sure, it I does. think because no matter what you're getting for your five hour work week, <laughs> if someone next to you is getting paid three times as much, it doesn't matter how much you're getting paid. It it screws around with you a little bit. I think when, um, especially on a show that is such an ensemble. Mm-hmm. Um, Every, all six of us are always in every episode, mm-hmm. even if you only have two lines. Um, but I do think it levels the playing field. I think, to your point, it is a good thing. So, favored nations, everyone gets paid the same. And that started un, not until season nine. Correct. And how did that come about? I'm sure it was a mistake. It was um, prior to that, we all, we, nobody knew what anybody else made and we got different amounts. And then somehow Fox Business Affairs, we, and we used to also just sort of back up for a second. So our contracts for the six of us, we were never, none, all, all stuff, sorry, all six of us never had our contracts up in the same year. Mm-hmm. So at least two of us were always under contract. Mm-hmm. And then... This year, this season nine year, uh, all of our contracts were up. And that gave us an opportunity to band together like the Friends cast had done. And mm-hmm. we were stronger in numbers, right? You couldn't mm-hmm. pick us off. You couldn't pick up all six of us. Who Although instigated they that? Um, it was a no-brainer. Like when the attorneys went, oh, wait, oh, shit, oh, what? Okay, this is an opportunity. And so, um, so we did it. And it's been that way ever since. Did they, when the guy came in and who did the spot on Michael Jackson song, did uh, any producers go, you know, they, he can do a Lisa Simpson too. I know. Apparently I'm the hardest one to do. So even though I only do one voice, I feel like, okay, I have a tiny bit of job security. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if this is correct or not, but everyone else is kind of doing a voice. You're I am, doing I, a version of I you. Am. So, I This is me. This is Lisa Simpson. We're not that far apart. Right. So <laughs> it'd be harder to replicate that. Yes. Because yours and is more organic. People tell me my voice is placed very far forward, like up, up here, as mm-hmm. opposed to, I don't know, further back somehow. I don't Go figure. But, you know, symbolically... It's very interesting that you grow up with this voice. The voice is unusual. You're the subject of ridicule. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get picked on and stuff. Uh, and then you take that voice and you cash it in and turn it into, you know, one of the, if not the longest running since Wait Till Your Father Gets Home <laughs> 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 series. Uh, forget about animated series, just sure. series. Uh, and the the amounts of money and the success all because of this thing that you probably wish you could have gotten rid of when you were 14. Yes. And even still now, sometimes when I, if I see myself on film or I see myself in a TV show and I, I just think, God, it'd be great if you could just, if you could drop into that and it wasn't always with you, mm-hmm. but then you could, and you could sound sort of a little sort of husky and a little throaty like that. But every time when I, when you used to have answering machines and now people, of course you still have voicemail, but mostly people don't leave messages. But when you had an answering machine, I used to leave the outgoing message and try to lower my voice to sound more my age. Invariably I would get messages like, are you all right, Yardley? You sound a little sick. You don't sound so good. Are you okay? I'm like, fuck, come on, give me a break. I'm trying to, just trying to sound like less like a, you know, a seven-year-old. So, 
<laughs> Does uh, are there any signs of slowing down? Does anyone ever think, God damn, it's been thirty four years? Like, you know, it's time to sit on the beach. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I would assume it'd be less of a lot of the voice actors because your your work week isn't what the true. guys in the writer's room is, right? But I, that's, it is true. Um, I mean, truly, again, in so many ways, best job in the world because time-consuming-wise and compensation-wise and creativity-wise, it's it hits all of the, um, you raise the bar so high. But for the writer, I think the writers really love it. One of the things that Jim Brooks stated to Fox when we spun off into Half Hour was he said, I'll, I'll only do this if we get no studio or network notes. Right. Which is very, very unusual. But he's James L. Brooks. You go, well, fuck, the dude, I mean, he doesn't get much better track record than that. And so they were like, sure. And also, I think, under their breath, they thought, and the show will never last. It'll never even go past 13. So you can do whatever you want, dear Brooks. And now here we are. And so for the writers, it's an enormous luxury to be able to write for yourself. And you still have to adhere to standards and practices. But at the end of the day, you don't have the accountants coming down going, I think the story should go this way. It's the so, death of everything creative, sure. not just sitcoms or animated. It's the death of all forms of art. There's a bunch of people weighing in. It, yeah, it's the longest running scripted American primetime show. Um, who were some of the, you must have had some writers pass through there. Where you go, oh, yeah, that guy went on to host that late night show, or that guy <laughs> yeah. went on to blah, blah, Yeah, blah, that blah. guy, Conan. Also, was it um, Conan one of the writers? Yeah. Yeah, I, because I feel like I've, ta- I've interviewed enough people that go, oh, I wrote for The Simpsons. <laughs> We've had a lot. We've had a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, Brad Bird used to write on The Simpsons. Mm-hmm. He's won Academy Awards for animation. Um, we. We've had uh, Dana Gould. I know you've interviewed oh, yeah, Dana. Oh, yeah, Dana. He's great. Uh, he wrote on our show for a number of years. And then other, you know, writers who went on to write on other shows, like Ian Maxstone Graham wrote on our show for a long time, went on to do Veep, and, um, you know, it, 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 loads of folk. The uh, It seemed like The Simpsons and Letterman were like the two kind of kiddie pools for a lot of future talent. It was always a lot of, that guy did lay, worked on Letterman, and that, that guy worked for The Simpsons. Like, it's Simpsons, Letterman, Letterman, Simpsons. They, there was a lot of crossover. We had a lot of, we've had writers who worked on Letterman who then came over to The Simpsons. Oh, it was uh, like Don, Donna Long, Carey? Was, uh, yes, Donna Carey did. Um, I want to say there's a couple of others. Of course, we had George Myers, who had that, you know, who was a genius and had that, um, I remember that huge spread in The New Yorker. They did a biographical spread about George Myers. Did you, like, young Conan O'Brien, were you like, eh, that kid's got something? No. (laughs) (laughs) But I think he was quite different in the writer's room. Like, we only saw him at the table, Mm -hmm. you know, and he was pretty, he was not loud and brash or not cracking jokes all the time, didn't draw attention to himself to the point where I remember hearing that Lauren Michaels pinched him to go host his own show. And I was like, that guy? Right. Uh, okay. i like, ah. The guy who doesn't talk yeah. is going to do a talk that show? Guy? That's going to be interesting. But what do I know? So so uh, just to make me super jealous one more time, <laughs> the, the work schedule, forget about COVID, but <laughs> yes. for the last 30 years before COVID, 32 mm-hmm. years, would be go in how many days a week? Uh, one. Just one. Yes, Thursdays. Just the one. Thursday mornings. And then a week later, go in and record. Correct. And that's it. Yes, so if we recorded on that Monday and then we had a read through the following Thursday, now I'm working twice a week. Now you're going to get me killed because people are going to be like, what kind of fucking schedule is that? That's not not work. It's not even really a schedule. (laughs) It's like saying, I eat Froyo once a week. (laughs) That's about it. Or I work out once a week. (laughs) Did they have to send you the scripts at least for you to like underline stuff? Yeah. Yeah, they send you the script the night before. Depending on what kind of shape it's in, sometimes it arrives at, you know, 3 p.m. on Wednesday. And sometimes it arrives at 3 a.m. on Thursday morning. So, What is the um, – so your favorite episode, like like when you're reading the script, were there ones where you're like, this one is gold? Yes. Like, this is a good one. Yes. And was that one – and do they always come out that way? I mean, sometimes – 
people are wrong. Or sometimes you, you back to the kitchen, you're making something. Yes. You go, oh, it's got every ingredient I love. And then you, at some <laughs> point you taste this broth and you're like, why is this that good? It's so boring, right? Yes. Um, yes, once in a while. There are about... I want to say uh, this, this is sort of a number off the top of my head based on how many how much ADR we do. That is, for anybody who doesn't know, we go in and re-record lines when they've rewritten a joke because the animation process is so long. There are about four places, four periods where you can rewrite quite extensively, and it's not prohibitively expensive mm -hmm. to redo the animation. So. Mm -hmm. You can get a script that didn't really land at the table, and over the course of those eight or nine months, they yank that sh you know shit into shape. And so, mm -hmm. um, I would say I think maybe three times in the space of thirty-four seasons have we had a script that really bombed, and it was a complete rewrite, like not even the same story. Really? Yeah, that was that never happens. This is a really, these are like surgeons, these writers. They're, they're the finest of the finest. So even if something doesn't land quite the way they heard it in their head at the table, um, they rarely throw the baby out with the bathwater. And for you, your personal life, you're married? I'm, uh, I'm engaged for the, hey, third time. Third, third time's, time's a charm. charm. <laughs> That's what they say. Oh, man. <laughs> You better get that prenup going. <laughs> yes. But so are you, you like cooking. I do. But some other passion. I mean, you've, you've got time. I, uh, well, actually, I have a production company, a production and development company that's quite busy called Paperclip Limited. So you're going in every day? Uh, yes. And developing stuff and yeah. overseeing stuff. So you got a, you got a, a life. I, I mean, do. you got a world. I do, yes. <laughs> and uh, it's not all making meringue out of coconut oil, right? Or whipped yeah. cream, I no, should, I sure. should say. One of your, one of your videos I was watching last yes, night. Yes, yes. Uh, Yardley's <laughs> videos are great because she's like, I take the meringue, I take the coconut. We're gonna for you vegan people out there, we can uh, go ahead and make, uh, we can we can make whipped cream out using coconut, coconut oil. And she's like, here's the coconut oil, and I want to put in a little bit of powdered sugar, but yes. I don't have powdered sugar. <laughs> so I'll put in some cane sugar, and I'll put a little uh, vanilla, vanilla extract. And then she tastes it, and she goes, not great. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I thought she was supposed to lie at that point, say oh, no. what a great substitute it is for whipped cream. You know, I call it like it is. There's a fair amount of sw swearing on oil and water too, which we bleep out hilariously. But oh, and by the way, you're a true crime podcast, which yes. I forgot about. Small town dicks. Small town dicks. So I'm actually engaged to. So I co-host this podcast with identical twin detectives Dan and Dave, mm -hmm. and I'm engaged to Detective Dan, who's a, a real detective. A real detective. And what what's his beat? Where is he from? So he's uh, we so on our show we actually we don't tell you where the crimes took place and we change all the names. So I'm not going to tell you where he's from, but he's from another state. And uh, his he's retired now, and so is his brother. Dan investigated um, violent crimes, and Dave investigated sex crimes and child abuse. Ugh. Yeah, brutal. I. I, was, I I can't even imagine. No, you can't. We're talking about the the antithesis of the opposite of your job. I know <laughs> that job. I, oh I my don't god! Know you can you... never complain about your work day. I Not never in front do. of him. I never do. <laughs> but all of the cases on small town dicks are told by the detectives who investigated them. Mm -hmm. And my role is I'm if like if you had the privilege to sit at that table and ask these detectives any question, if even you know it, even if you thought this is a dumb question, uh, that's what I do. I ask all the clarifying questions, all the, and where do these things live in your heart and your soul? Mm -hmm. Like if you are the person who every time you leave your house, basically your job is to encounter somebody on their worst day. Mm -hmm. Where does that reside inside you, as a father, as a husband, as a friend? Uh, I would I would be a mess. I could not. I I couldn't deal with the family, the survivors, and all. I had breaking news to them, it's, asking them intimate questions. I I, I, uh, exactly. I I couldn't do it. Exactly. And so I think you know, there's a really um, important and relevant conversation these days about police reform. 
Um, but I also think one of the things our show does is also shed light on the complexities of this job. Um, I don't think everybody is cut out for the job, honestly. I couldn't do it. And so, um, anyway, it's a, it's a great way to get a different perspective on policing, I think. I would be great at it, but <laughs> I wouldn't... Are you not conflict averse? I would not want to do it, but I would kick <laughs> ass at it. Hi, look, I, I got to be honest. I, I, my head's on a swivel. I notice everything. I have many famous stories of my assistant, huge Simpsons fan. What a picture of Matt Fondelier bedroom. <laughs> One of the Cracker Jack employees around here was a big, uh, that's him. Oh, when he was wow. 13, look, and he, look he's wearing his Simpsons vest. Yeah. Holy shit. Look at his slippers. That's fantastic. He walked in here one day years ago, and I just said, uh, wow. yeah, his room is. It's so neat. Yeah. It's so tidy. But here's why I make a great <laughs> detective, Yardley. Yes. Remember seven years ago when you walked in here? Uh, Matt Fondelier. <laughs> and I said, what? Uh, I'm lost. Sorry, go ahead. What's up with your shoes? Oh, yes, that's right. You observed uh, Adam. a pair of white tennis shoes that I was wearing. And he kind of looked me up and down and he said, where'd you get the shoes? <laughs> <laughs> to which I embarrassingly revealed they were my dad's shoes. No, the first thing he said was just, just tennis shoes. Wearing tennis yeah, I think shoes. I was trying to obscure the fact <laughs> that went, they were my dad's. I paused and I went, "Yeah, I need more. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not signing off on just tennis shoes." And then at some point, it got to it's his dad's. Was did the they point look too his... big for him? Is that what no, your powers it, of observation? It, it or? did not fit. Everyone has a pattern. I see everyone's pattern all the time. And if you break just a little bit yeah. with your pattern that I don't study, it's just in my head. If something's a little off, a little off. Like, what's my pattern? <laughs> I haven't been able to study you <laughs> long enough, but you need more than an hour. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> but I, there's, there's many that all someone has to look. If you go out to dinner with someone who never picks up the check yeah. and they go, Oh, let me, let me just pick it up. Let me just pick it up this time. Let me just pick it up this time. You have to stop. You have sure. to go to the pattern because what's going to happen next? You have to wait. Now and then they go. What's hey, uh, Yardley, I was I want to start my own record label, but I'm a little low on cash mm -hmm. right now, and I just it's a great idea. Just hear me out. And okay, they're putting the clamp on you for some cash, <laughs> and that's why they break they break their pattern. Right, everyone's a pattern, and when it breaks, you'll know it. That's well said. Yeah, I can see it like a cop driving behind a drunk driver. Right, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I can see they're not in there, but. But the rest of the world doesn't study it. I always study the pattern, but I, I don't do it consciously. It's just, it's just there. I do think that's a gift, and I think that the best cops, they are able to log information that way. Like Detective Dave told a story once of teaching himself to be able to memorize license plates as they go by him at 45 miles an hour in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. You're like, what? Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. Like insane, insane powers of observation. Yeah, I'd be good at it, except for I would be so squeamish and so uh, wanting to avoid all the confrontation and everything. Me too. Uh, I also hate, I wouldn't want to bust people. I'd be like handcuffing them going, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you know, it's my job. Sorry. Well, Dan and Dave always talk about even if a suspect gets in a fight with them, once the fight is over and they're in handcuffs, they're like, look, no hard feelings. I just needed you not to grab my gun. I needed to keep yeah. us both safe. But, hey, dude, I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here to keep, you know, the environment safe. You safe, me safe. Let's go. Well, it's a good man you got. Small Town Dick, season 10 premieres uh, Friday, wherever you listen to podcasts. And then also the cooking show, which was Oil and Water, but you can still find it under Oil and yes, Water, right? Yes, because it's so hard to start a new Instagram handle, so And <laughs> then <be> uh, <laughs> The Simpsons. Well, you know where to a find. show. You know where to find The Simpsons. <laughs> All right. I'm going to be in Indianapolis at Helium Comedy Club May 6th and 7th, and then Huntington Beach on May 20th, and we're at Denver, Springfield, Springfield. Hey. All over the place. You can go to amcroll.com for all that. Until next time, Sam Kroll for Gina Grant and Ball Bryan and Yardley Smith saying Mahalo. Oh. You know who's going to save LA from Barbara Ferrer? LL Cool J. Jeez. 
He'd give her fucking shagging of her life, and that bitch would come in whistling and smoking, holding a martini, going, I don't know, do what you want. I got to get back to LL Cool J. Mama said, knock you up, bitch. (laughs) 